Can I say again, so um, my hair color naturally has always been dark brown near black, near jet black. My pubes are black. Since I grew up from being a toddler, now I'm not going to keep repeating this. I'm sick of it. Every statement I've said is the truth. And if my mother screams her fucking voice off with her bullshit to get what she wants, I'm sick of it. I'm so sick of being lied about. It's insane that this was a discussion in the last nine, nine years. So I was a blonde baby, that's right. But, you know, I, again, ask people to look at photos of my half-sister Sky Sheridan Fleming when she was a baby and then look at me and she's got very similar hair to me. When Sky was a baby, her hair was dead straight, blonde, thin hair. Um, she grew up and um, ended up getting, well, she, she actually grew up and got really thick hair like my dad's side. So the Fleming side does have thick hair. Thick, untamable, frizzy hair is predominant on the Fleming side. My grandfather Stanley had it. Uh, my grandmother Ruby had curly hair. Um, my dad had wavy hair. So Mark Fleming has wavy hair when it's long. Um, his sisters, so um, Aunt Sandra had frizzy hair. Um, Aunt Linda has uh, frizzy hair. And um, I think Aunt Sharon, or no, Aunt Sharon said she had frizzy, frizzy, frizzy ish hair. It's because it's not dead straight. And there's no rule, you know, it isn't dead straight. So go and have a look at all the phlegm inside. So this is like my mother has issues. She really has issues. So let's go back with me. Um, so, yes, when I was a baby, I had baby hair. I don't, can't, I can't, honestly can't believe that this has to be explained to people. When you are a baby, you have baby features. You have toddler hair. Like, you know, so when you're a toddler, you have toddler hair. I can't believe people have to be explained this. But what happens is, morons, you grow up. Okay? There's a thing called puberty that you go through as well. Okay? I can't believe I have to spoon feed information to these wankers of people that like, well, he was a blonde baby. It's like, yeah, I was blonde till I was about three years of age. I was a blonde baby. And then I lost my baby hair. And my hair has always been frizzy. Actually, my bed hair, you can see it now, waking up. So this is, like, my mother's insane. Oh, my mother started telling people that I had fake hair and all this other bullshit as well. She's fucking insane. She is insane, the bullshit. Like, the only time, like, and my doctors have this on record, is when I had a bad immune system issue in 2010, and I was I had sores through my scalp. My mother is that insane, the story she's made up, and projected her second husband's family, the Rackleys, onto me. But here we have a group of people that still listen to my mother, and I'm like, why? I was never close to her. Why would you listen to her? She's a nut job. She's batshit crazy. I, I'm not close to her. She's literally batshit crazy. In 2017, she was making up all these bullshit stories in 2017. And people still listen to us like, she was trying to go, oh, he want, you know he thinks his cousins are rich. I'm like, no, I don't. And my mom was like, well, you said they live in Shell Harbour. I'm like, yeah, because my cousins do live in Shell Harbour. And again, these are my cousins on my dad's side, Carol. Nothing to do with you. So why don't you keep your nose out of my dad's side's family's business? Because, yeah, my cousins do live in Shell Harbour. I never said anything other than they lived in Shell Harbour and my mother gets jealous. My mother's a loser. Seriously, anybody who knows my mother, that means anyone from the horse industry who knows my mother and then thinks they can come near me, you're a fucking deadbeat loser. If someone ever comes up to me and is like, oh, I'm friends with Justin, I know Justin's mother, I'm like, then get the fuck away from me. She's a fucking deadbeat loser that I had to put up with. Like, my dad divorced her in the 80s, so he was a very intelligent, sensible man to look at her and go, I'm running a mile. What the government was extremely, um, you know, uh, negligent by not giving my dad, Mark Ian Fleming, full custody of his children. Because the, the right-minded person... The responsible adult to have custody of the children was the father, not the mother. But in those days, they just give everything to women all the time. So my mother got the house, contents, money from my dad and the kids, and she's crazy. 
She's crazy. She's batshit crazy. She is an insane fucking lunatic person. My mother, I can't stand her. She would cause so much. She doesn't care what she does. She will run around and light. She'll ring people and start crying and go, I'm a concerned mother. I haven't heard from my son. Yeah, I've, she's done this in the past. The difference is in the past, my grandparents, her, her parents used to put her in the place and they would, my mum would go around and go, don't listen to Carol. Don't listen to Carol. So my nan would stand up and say, shut up. Don't listen to Carol. She's lying. And that's the difference is now that my grandparents aren't alive, my mum's parents aren't alive, this is what happens. And I knew this was going to happen back in 2013. And I told, like, she was either going to play the mentally retarded game that she's done in the past, um, that scam and scheme, or there's going to be something. She'll play something to suit the Rackleys. So my mother has this deadbeat loser daughter that she had with her second husband, Faith Rackley, who's just a fucking deadbeat junkie like her father. And it has it hasn't got anything? And my mother used to always look at what I had because I worked hard for it. And she's like, "Oh well, you know, you could help Faith out." I'm like, "No, no, I'm not. She's a junkie." Like Faith Rackley sent me a text message when she was 21 to say that she's been addicted to ice since a teenager. She's a junkie. She's um, struggled with deep depression. So she's exactly like her father's family and she owed bad people. So I'm guessing bikey gang members and drug dealers, $15,000 worth of debt. And my mother wanted me to pay that. That's what my mother is. My mother is a little low life. She's disgusting. Like, and don't think, so don't paint. So look at my mother and then paint my mother's parents' family as being like that. My mother's parents' family aren't like that. My grandparents are beautiful people. My great-grandmother was. Like I said, my grandmother's cousin is from Bellevue Hill. My nan was like a very classy, very beautiful lady. She married, okay, a husband that she married. So Pop was poor Balmain family. Um, but they they were, um, you know, well, <laughs> nan always said they're not working class. Mum said, oh, they're working class. Nan said, no, we're not. <sighs> You know, we moved to a 1960s suburb and become middle class. She goes, I was a, like, this is what my nan and Lolly used to always say. Um, oh, and she was. I'm not, um, it's on all the records. So my nan, her job was a clerk. But nan said it it's, was, she did accountancy. Um, you know, she actually went to school to be an accountant and did the books. And she worked in Glee, but she gave that up to raise her family. And Pop was a butcher. So she said, like, you know, she worked, she had a trade. She actually studied to do that job. So my Nana Lola studied to do the job she did. And her husband, Reg, studied to do the job he did as a trade, as a butcher. So they're two people that were educated in those job fruits. And the thing is, when I came out that I was gay, the person I came out to first was my Nan. My Nan was more affluent than my mother. And that's the truth. So anyway, but I'm not getting into that subject, but don't ever look at my mother and think, oh, that's, you know, because my mother would turn around and go, oh, you know, they had this place in Blacktown. And my nan's like, yes, Blacktown. In the 1960s, 1962, when we moved here, then mum would say, oh, it was fiber. And she's like, Carol, you don't understand. In those days, these were new building materials and everybody thought that was somebody moving to these areas. We were moving out of the city. People were moving. We could afford to move. It was a big deal that they could afford to move out of the city. That's what my nan used to say. She goes, your mother's got it all wrong. When we were moving from the city, because, you know, they were still living in Roselle when my mother was a baby, my nan and pop said, we, it was, you were somebody. It was like, well, we, can, we could have, like, to scrimp and scrape to afford to move out of the city which is very different now. <laughs> but she said back, back in those days, no one would have lived in the city. And we had, you know, it was a beautiful brand new subdivision in 1962. So anyway, my mother goes over with her bullshit, but that's not what I wanted to say in this um, video. But yeah, she did. She's lied. She lied in 2017 and she's with all the bullshit stories. She probably got in with the low life scrubby people again, like she has since she got with her second husband. So her second husband's a real deadbeat low life. Um, the, deadbeat of low scum and this is what my mother was like growing up so she'll make up stories about anybody else that was in a happy marriage she'd always make up stories and go oh they're only in that marriage because of money they're not they're not in it for love like she was with mark rackley 
It was all, no one else is in it for love like she was with Mark Rackley. Oh, she, you know, and it was always, oh, Bev Jones, I think it was. Um, Bev, um, um, is it Bev Jones? Bev and Lindsay. Um, so it was mum's good friend when she mum worked at uh, the legal firm with Ian Scholbach. And that's the thing. Ian Scholbach's wife, Diane Scholbach from Clifton Gardens, was mum's good friend. She forgets about all these people when she got with her second husband. Anyway, um, so Bev, who worked in the same legal firm as mum in the city, and mum's always, oh, you know, she's only with that person for money. It's like, no, they're not. You just made these stories up because you're so jealous of, like, because you went with a low life after my dad divorced you. So my dad was a builder. My mother was a paralegal. Dad divorced her. And my mother went with an unemployed deadbeat loser nurse that was a drug-using, cannabis-smoking alcoholic. And she's like, well, I, I did it. I found love. I didn't chase money. It's like, you'd found love in a deadbeat, low life, trash, gutter trash person. And then my mother once asked, so myself, my twin sister, to do the same. So she would keep interfering in any decent relationship that my twin sister had. To And she did. It, whether I like my ex brother in law or not is beside the point because that's not nothing to do with me. I don't have to like him. Um, my sister has to. Um, but she always wanted my sister to go out with some drunk from the pub, um, deadbeat loser. So copy in her life. And she was the same with me. If I ever went out with anyone that was my same social standard, um, she would cause trouble and wants me. She goes, I do. Why can't you just be happy and go out with someone normal? Like, and I'm like, Oh, you mean somebody that uses drugs and is an alcoholic that doesn't work? Um, and is a deadbeat gutter trash like your second husband. That's what she meant. And it was always like, oh, at least she'll be happy. It's like that. She's insane. My mother, Carol, is insane because that's not normal way to think. That's not normal. That is really not normal. And I actually started moving away from my mother when I was seven years of age. Um, before, even before, she's insane. You're like, and I'm telling the truth. What she did to my father, Mark Ian Fleming, is disgusting. She abused him. My mother's no victim. She is an abuser. She's a perpetrator. She abused him. I remember the day he left very clearly, and she was abusing him. And he didn't do anything wrong. You know, there'll be something, there's always something, you know, with him. He was just a hardworking build up. There was always something. Even mum's sister, Robin Childs, I wish she would fucking speak up because she saw mum pour a hot cup of coffee in my dad's ear and burn him, scald him, burn him. Do you know why? He was so exhausted from working so much that he was asleep on the lounge. That was her excuse. She's evil. She's evil. She was the same. So she was like that. That thing of that, how that was to my dad. Then after my dad left, she was torturing me my entire life. She was evil. She used to get me out of the bed in the middle of the, no of the night and wake. This is when we still lived in Dunsmore Street, Rudy Hill. It was horrible. I was always at my nan and pop. She was torturing me my entire life. As a little kid, she tortured me. She's disgusting. I hate her guts. I hope she rots in fucking hell. She should be sitting in jail, but because we live in a country like Australia where they really don't arrest women, and I really have stood up and gone, she abused me. She fucking abused a child. I don't care what I am now as a 45-year-old man. She Don't say this is about letting go and moving on or get counselling for it. She should be in jail, you disgusting country. You disgusting fucking country. I hate Australia with a passion. My mother, Carol, should be in jail. It is that simple. She should be in jail. She is a disgusting piece of shit. She tortured me so much growing up. It was horrible. She split my head open, and that's the truth. And the reason she gave, I didn't put the hat in the hat bag properly. Yet yeah, this happened. She is a horrible person that started getting listened to since 2015 and they're going, don't. Like all these arguments that went on through social media. It's like, yeah, but this is why I keep distance from my family. There's a reason why. Oh, it, what else? She, was, um, she rang my real estate agent. I'm a concerned mother. Oh, she's always a concerned mother. No, you're not. You're just in between boyfriends. You're not concerned. You found out how much money your son had in the bank and you want him to buy your deadbeat junkie daughter a house. And that's the truth. 
yeah, Giovanni started trouble in 2015 and my mother rings me and I'm like, and I was stupid enough I, we, the other takes back. I'm like, that's not true. I've still got all my savings from when I sold Scott's Road in the bank and I sent my mother the amount of money I had in the bank and she turns around and she goes, oh, if you've got that much money in the bank, you can buy a house here and Faith can live in it. Faith's got nothing. I'm like, Faith's got nothing because she's a junkie that you give everything to. Faith Rackley is exactly like her father, Mark Rackley, exactly like her brother, Daniel Rackley, and they're fucking junkies. And I sit back laughing and think that Mark Rackley's brother, Peter Rackley, was a, a detective in Parramatta for the drug squad. And I'm sitting back really going, is that why your brother's gone away with that behavior his entire life? Because he's, because you're his brother? Yeah. Oh, talk about corruption in the police force. Because Peter Rackley... Mark Rackley's brother, it was a detective in the drug squad in Parramatta. And I'm talking about, um, so, and whether they're nice or not, I don't give a shit. I mean, he's a lot nicer, Peter Rackley, than his brother, Mark Rackley. But beside the point, it's like, seriously, so you, you're a detective, you're going to turn a blind eye to your own family, you know, because your brother is this. But let's turn a blind eye because as the police force, you protect your own family and go after... I thought you meant to go after criminals. Well, there's the criminal sitting right there, your brother. Seriously. And that's the fucking truth. And that's... Um, what is it? Um, uh, Brooke and Aaron's father. Brooke and Aaron Rackley. I think they might still live in Rudy Hill because that's where, you know, um, or in that area in the western suburbs. So I think it's Kerry Rackley's husband. Uh, is it Kerry? I don't got nothing wrong with him. I used to see them at church, but this. uh go to the same church growing up. Like, I don't have anything, a problem with Mark Rackley's sister-in-law and their children. My, I went to St. Pat's in Blacktown growing up and every Christmas I used to see my step-cousins at church as well um, because I don't think Mark, well, Mark Rackley's a different religion to us, but where I'm the Roman Catholic and I think his brother's um, wife was Roman Catholic as well because we all went to the same church. Um, well, not together, but we'll be at St. Pat's for Christmas in Blacktown. And um, I would see, like, you know, most, you know, years I would see my step um, step cousins, which is Brooke and Erin Rackley and their mother, Kerry Rackley, um, at church. And their father um, is my step uncle. And my step uncle was um, the detective for the drug squad in Parramatta. And his brother is my stepfather, Mark Rackley. He's the lowest, lowest of fucking scum who all the... Let's see, my dad, Mark Fleming, the builder, um, give, gave my mother everything. And what did my mother do with all this money and assets and everything? Gave it all to Mark Rackley, her second husband. So it, even my dad's tools. My dad, even my grandfather, Reginald George Purdy, said that's not right. You know, that's, that's Justin's father's tools. That's not right. Um, dad, when he walked out, he left, like I said, I remember this day clearly, he left everything in the house. So when he walked out, um, we had a big foyer area in Rudy Hill. I remember it very clearly. So he couldn't deal with mum anymore and he walked out. He was bawling his eyes out because he was leaving us behind. And he jumped in his car and he went to Parramatta to um, Nun and Pops in Rainbow Street. But he left everything. He left his clothes in the wardrobe. He left his work bag as a build up. He left all his tools. He just walked out, left everything in the house. Didn't take a thing with him. Didn't take anything. And that all stayed there. Um, his clothes, everything. And um, mum gave all his tools. So my dad's a builder. <laughs> mum gave all his tools to the deadbeat junkie nurse that she remarried. And even my mum's father, um, Reg, said that's not right to Lola. That's not right. That's Justin's father's tools. That's not right that she does that. That's what they're saying about her own daughter. And she did. So everything. So then suddenly my stepfather moved into my father's house and took over. It was my dad's house. My dad restored the house and my stepfather moved into it and took over. I have not had a home since I was seven years of age, which is why I was very close to my grandparents. That was my home. Like that has gone on since I was seven years of age, which is really pissing me off when people interfere with my home environment because that since I was seven and you can ask anyone, Oh, well, you can't now, they're dead for Nan and Pop. But I always had a room at Nan and Pop's. I would give a shit about my bedroom at my mother's house after my dad moved out. And then I always had a room at Dad's when we were kids until Dad got with her, um, with my half-sister's mother. But when Dad was with Annette, 
they had this beautiful house and Annette didn't want any kids to give you an idea. But her partner, my dad, came with kids and they brought this stunning house that dad was restoring and Annette made the most beautiful bedrooms for Amanda and myself um, to have like, yeah, it was stunning. So she, even though she wanted kids, she accepted her partner's kids and um, yes, yeah, never wanted her own kids. But, it was funny. We had like, we went to dad's, like we had clothes hanging up in the wardrobe. It was beautiful. Like both our rooms full of antiques. It was stunning, but yeah, it made us feel welcome. But no, since my stepfather moved into my dad's house, it's been the same for years. My mother's just disgusting to, to do that behavior is just not. And she just wants to be around these low life scumbags of people. Oh, and then she's all big on the aboriginals because apparently Mark Rackley was aboriginal. Yeah, but I'm like, yeah, well, that that's that explains so much, because um, she's always like, oh yeah, um, who was it? Nengi, his grandmother's Aboriginal, Nengi. I was like, well, that explains so much. That explains so much to do with his drug fucked junkie low life behaviour. That he's an Aboriginal, apparently. So yeah, that according to Carol, according to Carol, he is. I'm like, yeah. So she wants to be with the lowest scummy pieces of shit people. And both her parents used to say that as well. You know, don't know what happened to her. Yeah. She's crazy. And what she just did to her own son since 2015, this all started because I left my relationship and was staying away. It was a discussion that was between Giovanni and myself. Should have stayed that way. No one else should have been involved where everybody thought they could get involved. It's no one's business. My my personal life, through my relationship, you shouldn't get involved. Um, that's something that we should have discussed out, but Giovanni can't communicate. I think that's because he's a Mormon or born-again Christian, Jehovah's Witness, whatever way he's been brought up. He just has no idea how to communicate, you know, in relationships. No idea. So, um, and he contacted my mother. Anyway, my mother called me. Uh, to do with money, and I said that's bullshit. Still got all his, and here's a copy of my bank statement. And as soon as I sent it, I was like, "Fuck!" Nan and Pop always said never tell. They used to say never tell Mum, but then Nan used to say, "Don't tell my daughters your business." I'm like, "Shit!" And then Mum's like, "Oh, well, you've got that much money in the bank, but you could buy a house here." In fact, like Faith's got nothing. You know, she's rented. She could live in that. I'm like. No, you do know I'm moving to America. You were told I'm moving to America. The only time I'm, I was looking at a period to buy a place was when I was going to um, buy a place, do it up, interior design, like put my, what I learned, interior decoration into a place and then sell it on in a year. Like the only time I've ever looked at buying a place was near the beach, which was, you know, a good uh, investment. It was a rundown place that I was going to do up on weekends with my cousin's husband and make some money out of it to have extra money to go to the US. I said, no, I'm not touching that savings. That savings is for me moving to America and purchasing in America to live because that's where I'm going to live permanently. You know, I've got a green card. I've worked towards a green card for a long time and I'm going to be living in America permanently. You know, that was the only reason why I was hanging around in Australia. So you knew. And that's where all this started from in 2015. And then suddenly, Carol's making up stories um, to people. She's contacting my real estate, causing me trouble from where I was living. So everywhere I moved to, she would turn up and cause trouble and tell bullshit stories to people. Oh, can you keep an eye on him? Oh, you've got like all this crap. It's like, can you stop? Can you stop causing trouble in everywhere I live? Because I'm the one that has to pay for it. Like, are you deliberately trying to make me homeless? which is what she would do. So then you've got control of me. I hate her. I hate her so much. And her low-life scumbag daughter from her second marriage, I hate her. I hate her guts. She's exactly that. She has the same issues that her father's family has. She's exactly her father. And if she has any slight bit of our mother in her, well, then she's doomed. She has her father's um, drug addiction, alcohol addiction, lying, thieving, um, mental health, depression, suicide behavior, 
of her father. It's DNA right through that father. It's the Rackleys. They all have it because the Rackley, Mark Rackley's children from his first marriage have it. Mark Rackley's child from his second marriage has it. It's right through the Rackley family. It's right through. It's prominent. It's their issue. Yeah, thank God I'm not from the, well, I'm not related, blood related to the Rackleys. I'm from the first marriage, so I'm a Fleming. Um, and I, yeah, not even get me involved in that shit. But, you know, there's a reason why I'm like, no, I've often make comments that, and it's true. It's like, look, there's no one that's, um, I've been really that close to in my family that's still alive. Because if you want to look at who I was close to, um, all of my time was spent with my nan and pop, Reg and Lola. And outside of that, it was Maisie, big nan, Marianne, um, or, um, and um, her brother, Uncle Fred, which is Leo. So, yeah. Um, that's it. But no, I'm not going to keep putting up with hell when I worked so hard to have what I had and then to be lied about. Oh, um, just one thing after the other in the last nine years. And if, if I had have been able to secure a decent solicitor, instead of me being an idiot, because okay, I would admit um, I was an idiot. As soon as I knew I was getting monitored and surveillanced after I was lied about, or there was information that was twisted to be sinister that wasn't, as soon as it happened, I was being a smart ass. Um, maybe it's my, what's that, protective blanket to be sarcasm and, you know, it's being a smart ass back. But I was getting monitored and surveillanced. And I was. I wasn't a fool. Um, that's for sure, because it was so obvious. So I was walking up to these idiots like I did to Lavinia. Um, and I did. I deliberately did this to Lavinia um, and pretended that I couldn't remember <laughs> couldn't remember her name, Lavinia. Oh, I can't remember. I've got short-term memory loss. I've got a speech impediment. I was being a smart-ass to her because she deliberately harassed my life. Um, and because uh, I'm sick of this. I'm so sick and tired of this behavior. So I was so sick and tired of it. So she was coming up and um, I, was, I was there saying, oh, I can't remember your name, but it's Nana Ruby, isn't it? I was like being a like this pain, like I'm having a breakdown. Um, I said, oh, you remind me of my Nana Ruby. Oh, it's Na hi, Nana Ruby. Doing, I was doing this deliberately. I literally did. Even Geo said, Justin, stop it. Because these people think that that's what you're like. I'm like, I know. But eggs on their face because I'm going to turn around and say you know you're fucked that's called acting dickhead that's called acting you fucking loser you're the one that harassed my life I didn't come after you I didn't involve you you involved yourself in my life not the other way around you were never asked by me myself to involve you into my life but you went ahead and did I played a prank back on you because you're a dickhead you're a fucking dickhead and I deliberately did that I went to this lady, I'm like, oh, hi, Nana Ruby. And she's like, oh, you've, you're, you're, you've got a little dog. Oh, it's like a little baby, like a little baby. I'm like, oh, yes, I always want a son, and God gave me a dog instead. <laughs> she's like, really put it on. Like, yeah, that's, as you can tell, by the camera, yeah, not real. Um, I did it better than that. Oh, you should have seen me when I was walking around um, crying. Um, remember, that's so easy. I, I you know, um, do to, especially when I had um, training from Screenwise to be able to do that. Um, crying, go, I shake with the left hand because it's close to the heart. You yeah, know, I fucking don't. I don't fucking shake with the left hand, you morons. But if you want to monitor and surveillance me, you lied about me and harassed me, then I put on a show for you. It's that simple. Hope you got front row seats because they're going to be really expensive when you're going to pay me damages. And I mean it. Like, that wasn't true. And what's the other thing? Um, on the balcony, I was playing a prank on the junkie mark. And I don't, I've got to think, I hate junkies. I hate people that have drug and alcohol issues. Absolutely. I've never made that. Um, I've never actually been shy to say this my entire life that I can't stand people with drug and alcohol issues. I can't. Like, you know, even you gotta you gotta put up with them in society. Well you don't actually do you? Because even at the working at the casino I didn't have to put up with people with drug and alcohol issues. You know, it's you know, well back then it was a classy environment. <laughs> Somewhat classy. You had your scrubbers, but still. Um yeah. You know, you know, most people like that go to clubs. 
most people with drug and alcohol issues go to the cheap areas like RSL clubs where they can get their cheap fixes. You wouldn't go to a casino. Um, yeah, they go to diggers, those people. Um, but yeah, so, um, yeah, I've never made it, Yeah, you know, like, um, um, never shied for, to actually stand up and say, yeah, I really can't stand people with drug and alcohol issues. The only good one's a dead one. You know, like that's a saying that I've used and, you know, that's how I feel. Simple. My dad's side never had drug alcohol issues. My dad's barely drunk alcohol in, in his life. I mean, God. I remember my dad's niece was all in up in arms going, I think Uncle Mark's something wrong with him. I was like, what do you mean? It's like, well, I went over and he was having a beer and it was five, like I think it was last beer, five o'clock in the afternoon. And he was having a beer at five o'clock in the afternoon. And it's a weekday, Justin. That's So that shows you the Fleming side. Like, because they don't drink. Like, back, none of them drink, really. Like, my dad's side of the family don't drink alcohol. Um, they've got it there for entertainment, but they barely. It's like, I remember Beck was going, like, oh, Jazz, oh, like, love, something's wrong with Uncle Mark. Like, my dad, I'm like, why? Well, I've popped past over and, like, it was just, I was, like, I think it was, like, just on five o'clock or something. Was, you know, it was after, you know, it was early evening and he was having a beer or something like this. I'm like, okay, but it's a weeknight, okay? Like, it was just the one, my dad's barely ever drunk type thing, like Mark Fleming. It's like, okay, and she was really concerned. That's my dad's older sister's daughter. So that shows you their mentality, like, they don't, use they don't abuse drugs or alcohol my dad's side they're not like that my stepfather's side do massive huge difference so um yeah so it's upbringing you know i go to my dad's side and we still don't have coffee we don't drink <laughs> like you can, like it's like oh you want to meet up yeah we'll, we'll, we'll meet up at a coffee shop or something you know like i'd never known him to be drinkers but anyway um i'm not gonna get into this i've yeah and the other crap, this where people just playing victims lately. Hashtag me too, victim. It's like, yeah, man, I have thick skin. I've been for hell my entire life and bounced back. I got mugged after work and bounced back. I got went through immune deficiencies in 2010, bounced back. I was still pushed through to get my green card to the US. I was like, no, nah, nothing's going to stop me getting my green card. That's it. I've been I've been preparing to get a green card since I first travelled around the US in January and February 2001. Mind you, before that, I was always like, no, that's where I'm going to be. Even as a teenager, I'm walking around with my Yankees caps going to be, My dad played baseball. That's how I got into like. So I'm wearing a Yankees cap as a teenager um, because I had an interest in baseball, but I also had baseball as prominent in my upbringing because my dad played baseball. My dad did. He used to play, even as a kid, he played for Parramatta Wolves. I played soccer. Dad played baseball. And there's photos of me wearing my Yankees cap. Um, so, yeah. There's actually photos of me as, like, a 12, 13-year-old wearing my Yankees cap. Um, so, yeah. And I was like, no, that's it. I know that it's a good fit for me, the US. I know the type of person I am. That's a good fit, and so forth. Um, then... Amanda moved there, my twin sister, and I was like, oh, fantastic, because at first Amanda was going to move to the UK, and then she changed at the last minute and then changed to America, and I was like, oh, this is great. So in the year 2000, my twin sister moved to America, and she had a really good family she worked for in Stafford, Virginia, and, you know, she was went to New York first. I don't know if she, I don't think she liked New York, and I, and I did, I've always, but Amanda's not a city person, I am. Uh, but I know she loved um, Washington, D.C. And I stayed with her when she was living at Stafford, Virginia. I think it was, I can't remember. I think it might have been Marion Street, something like this, in Stafford, Virginia. And um, the people that she lived with there, which was Kevin and um, Cindy Burke. And it was really nice. And um, I thought she was just, you know, that's where she would have stayed. I honestly thought, it, you know, she should have stayed. I never, she was coming back to Australia and I'm like, why are you coming back? Because Kevin said he'll help you with a green card, which he did. Kevin Burke um, said, you know, like he, he wanted the man to stay and uh, like a man is boss and he and said that he would help with a green card. I said, Amanda, I would get a green card. I'm going to work towards getting a green card. Like you should really should get a green card. 
Like, she was only on a working visa. And I'm like, Kevin and Cindy are going to help you get a green card. You want to get a green card? I couldn't believe she moved back to Australia. I, I was just like, I can't believe why you moved back to Australia. There's nothing in Australia. What are you going to move back for? Like, this is back in the year 2001. I'm in America in January and February traveling around with Amanda. And I'm there going, but what are you, why? Why are you moving back to Australia? There's nothing to move back to. You don't have anything in Australia. Like, there was none and pop, basically. You know, but that's it. We've got, like, there's none. And when Amanda moved back, she moved back and was living with none and pop in Blacktown. And I'm like, that's it. You know? Yeah, well, actually, back then, there was still Nan and Pop and Uncle Fred. Um, Uncle Fred was still alive as well. He was still living in Leichhardt. And um, so I did. I set out to get a green card since. You know, I was you know working my way up in the casino industry and going, okay, I'm going to place myself in a good situation in the casino industry. And that will be because, you know, casinos are, you know, everywhere in America. I'm like, well, that's going to always give me options to be able to work in any state because I'm not going to go and study to be, a, you know, like something like a doctor, a nurse or anything like that. There's no fucking way. I'm not interested in that. And I'm like, well, casino industries are everywhere. So if I want a job that I can always go to, I'm like, I'll work my way up and be up in the casino industry and then be moving there. And that was my first instinct um, of that as well. And I did. You know, mind you, I applied for the job at the casino industry in the year 2000 um, as soon as uh, Amanda moved. And it was... A uh, boss who actually gave me the idea it was Caroline Wright. He told me, um, so I did. So I couldn't believe Amanda moved back to Australia. Couldn't believe it. I was like, okay, but I'm still going to go for a green card, and I did. Nothing was stopping me. Um, you know, as soon as I got mugged and went home from work, November thirtieth, two thousand and seven, and I was off work. I'm like, okay, well, I was only hanging around Sydney because, and I, I'm from Sydney. I was like, I'm only hanging around because I had a really good job. Um, now I'm going to apply for the green card. I'm going to go back to my studies in design. Like I had, I was like always focused. It was like, I just got mugged. Um, what can I do? Well, I studied art and design. I'll go back to study in design because well, you know, pays bills, design work, art doesn't. Um, I'll do that. And I'll start applying for the green card to America because who knows how long this is going to be. We've um, been off work. And I did. So every setback I've had, I pushed forward. So no one can say I haven't let go and moved on. You're lying about me. Anyway, the last nine years have been the worst part with what I went through. You can't let go and move on from having your credibility destroyed. Like my, my, my reputation is tarnished. And all I did was I'm getting monitored by ridiculous organizations and I'm being a smart ass back to them from 2016 and 2018. It's like, but you are monitoring me. Why are you doing this to my life? Why are you deliberately causing me grief? Why are you disrupting my life and disrupting what I'm doing? Like I've said, I've got a green card since 2014. Now, I, this is you want to help? Good. Um, my great uncle Fred gave me all of his. Like I've got some great slides and artistic slides. He was a good photographer. Um, he gave me back in around '96 when he gave them to me when I was studying and doing fine arts in Newcastle and doing photography. And I've got his cameras. I wanted to on his best work, and I've got some really good ones. Even you know before the war, put a coffee table book together. I want to be able to do this, just so there's something for his legacy to live on. I you know I've got I've, even recently where I've got the information to do I knew the information to do with Rose Bay where the um, seaplanes come in when that was a military base because Uncle Fred lived up the road in Bellevue Hill. Um, oh, his real name's Leo Patrick Sayer. You want to help? Then good. This is what I'm trying to achieve. Okay. Um, I'm also still having to go through what I have to go through with injuries from being mugged after work, but I do want to achieve returning to my old job so it bridges the gap. You don't understand that I'm telling you what I want because, I, yes, I was mugged and robbed after work, but I want to prove that I can bridge that gap. I've given the, um, still got my assets, still got my belongings, everything I worked hard for, still got my health, still got my figure and my looks back then and would be able to return to duties as a VIP host or negotiate to go even training, which is what I kept working towards executive host. You could do that for me when this part salary payment is over and I'm meant to negotiate my job back in 2017. You could do that. You could help me do that. You want to help? Then that's what I'm asking to help with because not this, you need to learn to let go and move on. 
no, that doesn't help me. There's nothing to learn to let go and move on from. There's a negotiation. You want to help? Then help me push this negotiation through. I'm meant to be able to return back to this job role. And I need to bridge that gap. That's very important to be able to bridge that gap. Because that shows, yes, he was mugged after work. Yes, he had time to recover. And yes, he returned to some job. Whether it's even three days a week or two days a week, if I couldn't do it full time, it doesn't matter. You helped me with what I was specifically asking for you to help with. The other thing as well, when it's like, well, I don't find this to be too daunting to try and accomplish or accomplish all of this, because when it comes to my creative side, um, that's just relaxing. It doesn't feel like work. So putting my own art exhibition together, which is what I, so I set out everything once I've got the green cards, like, right, what do I want to achieve? My own art exhibition. I never said I'm a great artist, but I've still done art and I've won awards in it back years ago. And I was like, okay, well, why would I do this? Because it puts me in that circle of people as well. And it could have been a flop. Like what if I, like I was going to do it at the space. There was, used to be a free art gallery on Crown Street in Surrey Hills. So I had already planned to go, oh, well, anyone can hire that space area on Crown Street in Surrey Hills. Now it's closed down. So I was going to put my own art exhibition on there in the space gallery. There on Crown Street, Surrey Hills. Um, put that together with my works. And um, whether it's, if it's a flop, it's a flop. Who cares if it's a flop? It, it, it didn't bother me if it was a flop or not. It bothered me if I didn't achieve doing what I said I was going to do. There's a difference. It's like, well, I did it. I didn't sell anything. Who cares? But I still did it. Okay. And then it still puts me into a group of people that the art scene it being, you know, so the art scene. So then when I did move, for example, if I went, you know, Chelsea, New York with the art scene or, you know, different areas. Actually, I'll tell you what, even the financial district has got a couple of good galleries now. I love the financial district. I, I, look, I, I love the fact that no one else does. When I've spoken to people, even when I was in New York in 2013, I'm talking about the financial district and everyone's like, oh, no, go to Brooklyn instead. It's like, okay, I love the fact that no one likes the financial district because it makes it cheaper to live and larger apartments. And I do. I sit back going, no one ever wants it. It's like, no, it's a bit of a sore spot for the financial district. I'm like, well, that's good. That's good for people like me that looks at it and goes, well, it's only over the bridge to Brooklyn, to the funky Brooklyn that's more expensive now than uptown Manhattan. Um, so I can just walk over Brooklyn Bridge to um, Brooklyn to all the little funky pot parts of it i mean look even um i think even dumbo in brooklyn would be even more expensive to be honest um and you know it's only about 20 minutes on the end train into midtown so i do really love financial district um for me you know it may not be like the new york what everyone knows because it's not the hustle bustle or the 24 hour um you know theater district um, but it's this little sort of small pocket hub that is, you know, nothing much there basically, but it's still, um, concrete. It's still skyscrapers. It's old buildings. It's cold industrial 24 hour city. If I can't sleep, I can go to the insomniac, um, ice creamery and get a, cookie and ice cream and sit down watch it across the Hudson River near P17 you know type thing it's city it's me I love the financial district always have um, you know but uh, yeah bigger apartments and um, cheaper you know so you know and you've got Brooklyn just a stone cross away on the bridge so there's actually a nice gallery there um, not far from um Oh God, there's a, it's a part I like in the financial district where it's all the old cobblestone area and there's a couple of funky boutique designer places that have popped up. It comes, it's um something Slip Street. It's down near, um, well, it's, down, it's not far walking distance from Pier 17 and it's this little sort of hub and there's a couple of great art galleries. So it's funky little spot there as well. Um, which I love. So that's the whole idea of me doing the whole, so first with Uncle Fred's photography work, plus 
you know, with my photography work from 1996, but my actual artwork, doing that as an exhibition. Um, going back, so I had studied um, design. So I studied design in 97 design in um, 2009 and 2010, but then actually doing something else in design that could, you know, mold me into different areas in America. So I'm like, okay, well, I've studied this. Here's my transcript. I've studied this. There's my transcripts. And then um, after I received the green card, I went back and I studied this. And here's my transcripts um, for that. Um, so I had everything in place. So when these idiots that were just harassing me, <laughs> Because they have this wrong information. It's like, well, you're not helping, you're hindering. Like, you know, if you want to help, then I've been very specific with what I've asked for help with. I want to be left alone. I've got pneumonia, bad pneumonia. In 2016, I'm like, can I be left alone? Like, I'm feeling really weak and run down. Can I stop being harassed by organizations? Uh, or can I stop being defamed and um, discriminated against? Uh, yeah. So even when I was trying to settle in Palmer Street, it was like, can I settle? I, I want to be here for two years because I'm not going to move to America until I've accomplished what I want to accomplish. And I was told I don't have to move until the green card's up for renewal in 2024. So I've got plenty of time to achieve what I want to achieve. Can you stop coming around to my apartment building? Like organizations were specifically told by me to stop coming around to my area. You're distracting me. You are deliberately disrupting me and stopping me from living my life organizations were told this several times since I was lied about in 2015 and they didn't stop. And they've got this belief that they were doing whatever they were doing. It's like what you're doing is disrupting my life and causing me damage is what you're doing. And you guarantee my mother was behind it. Gu well, guarantee, especially when she was one of the ones showing up. You know, like, it's like, what are you doing? Like I'm coming home from getting groceries. Oh, okay, fine. I played a prank on some losers because I was monitoring surveillance. Oh, well done. City of Sydney with his surveillance cameras. Oh, you look like an idiot. Oh, you're a fucking idiot. Seriously, I mean, I hate Australia so much. You know, they like, look like fucking idiots. It's like I had you fucking dickheads running around in circles. Seriously, I go play the biggest prank on the Stephanie DeSalas that was kept coming around harassing me. Like, he was... We're not friends. <laughs> She's talked to me from social media. We, uh, you know, I've already explained that. I'm going to explain it again, but it's been a smart ass. There's a scene in the film I did in 2007, so I repeated the scene. I was being a smart ass to her to try to freak her out and get rid of her. Um, you know, yeah, so, yeah, not real. I was just being a smart ass to people. It's like, what do these idiots keep coming around for? Why does this Mark Hanna keep showing up? Like, it was like, what the fuck? Like, I'm, I'm trying to live my life in peace, thanks. Like, these people aren't friends of mine. Anyway, so you would guarantee that whoever was the one that was causing all this trouble would have been my mother or my ex-partner. I often said, since I met my ex-partner, I was like, oh, my God, his nature reminds me of my mother's. He's exactly, like, you know, the whole um, bullshit fake crying and then I'll catch him out. It's like, yeah, but you screwed around. I know you did because the guy came and got his pawn and he next me he was changed like that and start getting angry or like when he was caught out screwing around in 2009 I'm I'm in um mate um my major design class with Julia and he got caught out like I actually rang rang him and I was going to do one thing that day like he was just living off me uh, he wasn't working that's in 2009 he got caught out for having an affair with this guy Jakum like he went Deliberately, like, whatever, using drugs and shit like he does. I was like, you got caught out, then you smashed up my apartment. Like, you were caught out cheating, and then you smashed my furniture for what you did, and he did. He smashed my furniture. He smashed my mar pink marble coffee table that John Cabino's mother actually gave me. And then when he was picking up the pieces of the marble, he cut his hand and had to get stitches in his hand. Why he's getting stitches in his hand, he rang his mother, and he goes, I'm in hospital again. This is what a little narcissist Giovanni Consalvo is. He's like, I'm in hospital again, stitches in my hand because um, Justin and I were fighting and I cut, no, yeah, because we had a fight like this. It was like, and it hangs up. I'm like, you want to tell the full story? And he goes, she doesn't need to. My parents don't need to know the full story. I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? So he's been lying about me since the day I met him. 
literally, it was in the hand hospital, Sydney hospital, it had stitches in it. The one there in, um, um, in the city there and, um, near, um, Lady Macquarie's chair. And, um, yeah, that's what he said. So he smashed my marble top coffee table that John Cabino's mother had given me when he was picking up the pieces of the marble, he cut his hand and had to have stitches in it. So he was cleaning up the mess that he smashed and then turns around. It's like, so we, you made it out that we're having a fight, but I'm actually at school studying and you were screwing around and I caught you screwing around when you were living for free in my apartment. So he's been lying to people since I met him, since I met the guy, since I met Giovanni Consalvo, he's been lying and manipulating and scamming and scheming and was so easily been able to get away with it because of my mother. He has. I hate his guts. He's right up there as the biggest narcissistic piece of shit guy that I absolutely hate. And I do. Because he's done this, looked at my situation, and used it for his own benefit and gain since I met him. Since I met him, he was living in a share house with nothing. No money, no assets, no belongings. Struggling in huge amounts of debt. He only lived in Sydney for 11, not even 11 years. Was moving back to Adelaide and saw an out. He saw a free meal ticket and that's the truth. And that's exactly what happened. I can back up everything I say is the truth. So no, I don't really want anyone in my life from Australia. Thanks. I don't have to, do I have to grovel to have a decent solicitor to actually um, get, you know, my credibility restored? I'm not going to grovel. Same in America with what I was put through. It's like, okay, forget it. I'm not groveling to renew my green card. Thanks very much. I'm not going to grow. It's like, oh, you, like my cousins on my dad's side who don't know me before Giovanni. So Fiona Woods and Meredith and Joan and jo, um, Jeffrey and everyone. It's like, okay. I loved it. Even uh, Margie Clay was like, oh, we love G. Oh, that's so sad. Oh, so sad. Why? You don't know what was going on. You have no idea what was going on. You don't know what Giovanni told you what was going on. You didn't even ask me. You only know what Giovanni was told you. So, so sad. Why? I left the guy. Good. Now, you know, leave me alone because I've still got my money and assets and my life to live. But no one left me alone. Oh, no, instead, that's why Giovanni went to organizations saying he was a carer. He wasn't a carer. He went around telling everyone he's his carer and involved people into my life to disrupt my life. So he's exactly like my mother when it comes to disrupting my life in the last nine years. This bullshit went and projected into America. Okay. That's what caused and cost me damages in America. And the same organizations that have caused and cost me damages in America or caused and cost me damages since 2015 to date are the same ones that turn around and keep slandering me and making up stories. Or oh, they don't want to pay for it. And they don't want to pay for the damage that they've caused. And they want to turn around and go, oh, he just wants money. No, I want what I worked hard for back then. You actually caused these issues. You caused these issues and I never involved you. What, beautiful? My dog wants my attention now. So that's it.